This is the High Flying Podcast where we be drop kicking it with the boys. So make sure to body slam that like, share, and subscribe button. I am your host, Biggie Bag Johnny, back with another video. And today we doing, of course, you know what time it is. My favorite segment and my dog favorite segment as well. Let's get into this one, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't know this family's dynasty, do your research. Become a better fan. Do what you have to do to become great like this family was, okay? The Graham family, if you don't know Eddie Graham in them, get to know them, all right? Because you're about to. Um... What I do want to let you guys know is uh, uh, this episode is definitely going to be about suicide awareness. You know, um, it's a very serious thing, guys. You know, you, you know, we have, you know, males that off themselves every year because of whatever, you know, like the, the, the suicide rate for, for males is, is ridiculous. You know what I mean? So, um. You know, everybody's going through something. You don't know what the next person's going through. So, this is suicide awareness. Uh, just checking on your people and stuff like that. Um, all seriousness. You know, we, we like to joke, pop shit, and, and, you know, watch wrestling. But this one right here, it's actually, we're, 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 we're going to be real serious about it and, and just show a little bit of respect. But also pop our shit. You know what I mean? But let's get straight into it, man. This is the dark side of the ring. My favorite segment, uh, the breaking the the dynasty curse of uh, the Graham family. Uh, this is gonna get real dark, man. Uh, that's all I can say, guys. You know, it's, it's just gonna get dark. So just prepare yourself, lock in. We are doing this. It is eight o'clock in the morning. I just literally got off of work an hour ago. I decided I wanted to do this for you guys. Because I see the channels growing, and I love it. I appreciate you guys for watching. I appreciate you guys for commenting. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. I've worked hard for all of this. So I appreciate all you guys that's just tuning in right now. So let's get into it right now, man. Dark Side of the Ring, Breaking the Cycle of the, dynasty, the, the Graham Dynasty, man. Let's get into it. Yo. Vice, man. Shouts out to Vice, man. Yeah, I don't know that there's thing. been any family in wrestling, either related for real or professionally, that had as much impact, as much reach, and as much influence as the Graham family did. That's a lie. Uh, Kane and Undertaker, the Hardy Boys, um, the Flares, uh, 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 shit, the McMahons, <laughs> duh. Um, the roads, the roads, shit, uh, fucking, uh, the whole tribal chief family, fucking all of them, mainly them motherfuckers, I forgot the last names, but yeah, all of them, all 16,000 of them. Graham has the hardest punch in wrestling history. Eddie Graham was not only a great wrestler and a great promoter, he was a visionary. Eddie's championship wrestling from Florida. It was built on wrestling, and the main events were violent. He gave the people the circus. Eddie Graham coming back into that ring after killing... Eddie Graham was a titan of professional wrestling who ruled his era and passed on his iconic legacy to his only son, Mike. The son of any great athlete, they've got the scrutiny on him. But Mike Graham didn't take shit off anybody. I think maybe he felt like he had to be as good as his father. Mike Graham followed in his father's footsteps to wrestling greatness and also descended into his own dark world of pain, addiction, and grief. The wrestling culture is very cutthroat. You have to have this thing about you where nothing's gonna break you. I want to know why is it that everybody that turns into a wrestler and that tries to be like the greatest wrestler of all time becomes a fucking junkie in some type of way. Either you're an addict to fucking heroin, crack, something like what the fuck is it? I get it. The pain pills and all of that. But what is it that is like I just seen my man's go. 
I'm just going to do this anyway. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, either take a break. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know, man. He was under tremendous pressure from so many different angles. Mike kept shit to himself, too, like his father. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. It all gets pushed under the rug. In certain families, who are you supposed to go to for help? The tragic legacy of a wrestling dynasty haunted by self-destruction and suicide. It is with a deep sense of regret that I announce the untimely death of a friend, a colleague, and a leader. It was like somebody dropped a bomb on all of us. Grandfather, father, and the kids, that runs for the family genes, right? Once that spotlight's gone, or once you don't have that ring, like, it's emptiness. This is starting off dark, off rip. Like, this didn't start off no, there was no, oh, yeah, no, we were in a happy little go lucky family and blah, 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 and North Dakota. And, and you know, we suffered bully, bullying, but then he hit the gym and, and then, you know, no, motherfuckers was like, yo, you know what? There's been some shit over here, boy. Yeah. There's some shit, man. Championship Wrestling from Florida was one of the most respected and successful wrestling promotions of modern times. The legacy of the Graham family in Florida is they meant professional wrestling to millions of people all over the state for almost 30 years. One member of the Graham family was on the card or in the main event or behind the scenes in the glory years when they were selling a million tickets a year just in the state of Florida to see live matches. And their TV ratings were Super Bowl level. I guess I was used to it. Like, when you don't know what's different, it's it's just what your life is. And I just knew that that was a huge part of, like, my grandfather and my dad's life. I am Nicole Gossett, and Eddie Graham was my grandfather, and Mike Graham is my father. And that's uh, Eddie Graham in the center of the ring now, his son Mike watching very carefully. Every Sunday, they'd have matches at the Eddie Graham Stadium. And the first phone call in the morning was my grandfather calling my dad to talk about the night. We'd wake up and we'd walk into like our family room to see who was crashed out on our couch for a little while, you know? Because we had different wrestlers sleeping on our couch at times. Magnum TA, Terry Allen, when he first started, he slept on our couch and he was so sweet. And so I was pretty accustomed to having big, boisterous personalities and people around. The one that scared me was Andre the Giant. And he nice. came like crouching. That is such a fucking flex. You got Magna TA, fucking, you got fucking Bret Hart, you got this dude, you got Andre the Giant, like, you just wake up for some eggs and shit like that, and boom, fucking Andre the Giant is in your fucking living room, just drinking wine, laughing hard, and just, like, you just, it's normal, bro. Like, that's a fucking flex, bro. Like, damn. Through our front door, I, he freaked me out, yeah. <laughs> I was scared. <laughs> that was the family business. Everybody wanted to be on the roster of championship wrestling from Florida, both for the money, for the weather, for the girls, and also to learn from Eddie Graham. I'm Jim Cornette. I've had a 40-year career in professional wrestling, but for even longer than that, I've been a collector and an historian. Eddie could make you believe that he was the toughest man in the state of Florida, which is exactly what most of the fans believed. He just had a magnetism about him, and he was somebody that you wanted to listen to, and if you were working for him, you wanted to follow. A leader, a general. Well, I was born up in the Tennessee mountains, brother. If you didn't have heart and desire, you were finished to begin with. So I ain't gonna lay down and quit. That's my bottom line. There you have it. The comments from... That motherfucker sound like Stone Cold before Stone Cold was Stone Cold, man. That mother... Yeah, j listen, man. He sound just like Stone Cold Steve Austin, man. Matty Graham. There goes a wrestler and one hell of a man. And he was a legend in Florida. He could get a reaction just walk into the ring. My name is Kevin Sullivan. I worked for the Graham family for decades, and I've been a wrestler for over 50 years. Your nightmare is just starting. And it was about five, ten and a half, wide shoulders, bleach blonde hair, and he just had a presence about him. 
nobody else was ever in his class. The genius of the business, R. Einstein. Eddie was from the hills in Chattanooga. Very difficult life. His father died young. Eddie came up through the uh, College of Hard Knocks. Just a good old tough country boy. My name is Dottie Curtis, and I am the wife of the late Don Curtis. Don was a very, very knowledgeable wrestler. Don and Eddie met back in around 52, I think it was. They became friends, and Eddie asked Don to come up here to Jacksonville, and he was the promoter up here for quite a few years. Now it's Graham with a good solid chop across the throat. Eddie Graham is probably ah, one of the... That motherfucker smacked the shit out that motherfucker. He smacked, he smacked that motherfucker out of his motherfucker. He smacked him out of his body, boy. You seen his soul leave them boys' boots, boy. God damn. The finest wrestlers that was around in his time. I don't think there'll ever be another Eddie Graham. Though born Edward Gossett, Eddie's wrestling career is forever altered when he adopts the Graham name from one of the ring's top stars. The originator of the Graham wrestling family dynasty was Dr. Jerry Graham. He had the bleached hair and he carried himself like a star and what's more, he had the gift of gab. We will be the international tag team champions as soon as that match comes off and it's gonna be the greatest match ever. Brother teams in New York were over at the time. But if you could find a guy that looks something like you, nobody's reading your birth certificate, just say it's your brother. Eddie Gossett was in Texas wrestling as Rip Rogers and a lot of people told him you look like Jerry Graham. Jerry and Eddie connected, and in 1958, the Graham brothers, the Golden Grahams, as a team, ruled the roost in wrestling in the biggest TV market in the country, where wrestling is already red hot, being presented in the most famous arena in the world, Madison Square Garden. Dr. Graham has just the treatment for that tired, nagging backache. Eddie performs the surgery while Jerry looks on approvingly. If you could sell out Madison Square Garden, you could sell out anywhere. Eddie and Dr. Jerry made a fantastic duo, aided by everybody, and just really drew the crowds in. And just main eventing Madison Square Garden, they were probably making close to six figures per year in 1958 and 1959, and that would translate into somewhere over a million bucks a piece in today's money. With money and fame to burn, Eddie and Jerry are box office sensations, but before long, Dr. Jerry's behavior outside the ring becomes even more notorious than his matches. Dr. Jerry Graham, as big of a genius as he was in wrestling, was an alcoholic, was mentally ill, and he got in a lot of trouble and caused a lot of trouble. Jerry Graham, to impress fans, used to light his cigars with $100 bills, or he would walk into a biker bar and walk right up in front of a guy and say, hey, my name's Balls, you got any? Oh, that nigga but was crazy, crazy. the shocking incident involving Jerry Graham transpires years later in his hometown of Phoenix, Arizona. One day he got the word that his mother was sick and in the hospital. And he called the hospital and he told the doctor that his mother better come out of that hospital in good health. And then she died. So, Dr. Jerry Graham shows up with a 12-gauge shotgun, a 38 caliber revolver, and an 8-inch long hunting knife, and appears in the intensive care unit where he fires a shot at the doctor. You gonna get away with it today, bro. And then goes down the hallway and grabs the gurney that his mother's body is on. Oh, yeah, no. And as he's taking it down the hallway, oh, here no, come yeah, the no. orderlies and the interns. And they're trying to tackle him. So he grabs his mother's corpse and slings her over his shoulder. And he's screaming, I just want to take her and bury her. Damn. What the Jerry fuck? Graham was so good at his chosen profession. And he was also completely, utterly insane. Yeah, that's crazy. That's wild. After two years, Eddie Graham could not put up with being partners with Jerry Graham anymore. And he had to leave the greatest spot that he'd ever had. 
In 1960, Eddie uproots his family from New York and settles in Tampa, like, Yo, bro, I, the hub of championship wrestling from Florida. He was a visionary. He said to himself, I know my capabilities as a wrestler. I can get over here. I can be the star. And this whole thing can be bigger. And over the next 25 years, not only did he become the most successful wrestler in the history of Florida and the most popular, but he worked his way into being able to buy into the promotion, then taking it over completely and expanding wrestling in the state of Florida and made it the place that everybody wanted to go to wrestle and to learn. Oh, he, and he probably the bought the territory man. just knowing that he had the wherewithal the brains, the connections with the talent to take the territory to another level. Hi, I'm B. Brian Blair, and I started wrestling in Florida in 1977. Got my start right here in Tampa. Blair has him up here playing spin. The armory was hot. I would call it like Saturday Night Fever. It was so entertaining. Tonight, we're in a jam-packed armory in Tampa, Florida, the home of championship wrestling. All the wrestlers from championship wrestling from Florida gave their all every Tuesday night at that place. Growing up in Tampa, these wrestlers were just huge. Fans wouldn't come up to them. Uh, we couldn't go anywhere without someone wanting to talk to my dad or my granddad. And it was telling that Eddie Graham would have continued good relations with Vince McMahon Sr. And later on with Vince McMahon Jr., he was someone that the other promoters all called to ask for advice. The president of the NWA, uh, Eddie Graham, now describing the conditions in the contract. Uh, both wrestlers are to post a... The National Wrestling Alliance was an organization of promoters from regional territories all over <clears throat> the country. It, there was no major decision made in the NWA without consulting Eddie Graham. He was president twice. He was well respected. But he was a complicated guy. And he would do some violent things. He was a tough, tough person. It you were... either did what he told you to do or you were out. Now, there was the side of Eddie Graham that did want to keep yo. the credibility of the wrestling business. And guys were expected to lay shit in, to make people believe what they were doing was real. Eddie Graham was a stickler, he said. If anybody here gets their ass kicked by a mark, you're fired. In other words, you get your butt kicked by a wrestling fan, you're out of here. You protect the business at all costs. I guess you could call it um, maybe a, a horror chamber down there at the sportatorium, but fellas would say they want to wrestle, and they figured all you had to do was get yeah. in the ring and perform. They'd put them through their paces, and, you know, some of them were just, they couldn't take it. I had to do things that I'm not proud of, uh, that I didn't like to do. A, like cu what? a couple of them I did. Well, they wanted you to break people's bones. Somehow, this guy got booked for TV. He said, oh, I've worked some local shows. I'm a butcher by trade. And I see Eddie's hair's perk up like a dog's. And the guy says, I'm going to make you look good. I'm going to tell all the guys you're a nice guy. So the guy drifts off in the corner, and he said, if he doesn't come back bleeding, you're through. Mm. I kept my job. Your marching orders were to, to make this guy bleed. I had a family. At that period, it was my livelihood. Wasn't his livelihood. So he was, he was he going was... to go back to that job no matter what. <laughs> so, yo, he was really, like, he was doing some fight club shit. Like, <laughs> Yo, I don't. I know that sounds sick, but it's like I know that's how all of these niggas are. Like I know that's how all of these motherfuckers are. Like yo, you're gonna be like that's how Vince is. That like, like the fact that he's like yo, break his arm, make him bleed, do this for the company. Like that's gangster. That's gangster. And then it's not like he's just sending niggas. Because he got the power and he's using motherfuckers. He's doing it. He's staying in front line with it. That's gangster, bro. That's gangster. 
Let's get into it. Worst thing I probably ever did. Eddie's hard-nosed ambition to dominate the wrestling trade is all-consuming, but his desire for power is far from his only flaw. Oh, I like this. I'm sorry. I like violence. Wrestler and promoter Eddie Graham I is like known violence. for his unrelenting drive, limitless ambition, and his determination to legitimize the business. Uh, Eddie was a go-getter. He had a portfolio of a lot of property. He expanded outside of the wrestling business. He wanted to write checks rather than receive checks. Eddie wanted to elevate the perception of wrestling. That's where he started getting involved with the Boys Ranch and with charitable organizations in every town and every county in Florida. They're furthering amateur wrestling programs. Eddie was a rock star in Florida. I mean, politicians were kissing Eddie's ass. To be seen on Championship Wrestling in Florida when you were running for office was a big deal. And I'm sure Eddie got favors from that too. Eddie was involved in everything. I think Eddie put a lot <laughs> That's of pressure the on himself. Man, he man. never wanted to fail in anything he did. And for most of the things that he did, like flying and being a boatsman and that, diving, he was fabulous. His only problem was that alcohol got to him. One night, Eddie was drinking and decided he was going out on his boat. And his son, Mike, was panicking because he took off in the car. And so Mike, as a young boy, he got on his bicycle and he drove to a cross bridge over the water. And his idea was he was going to jump off that bridge and onto the boat because he was afraid his father would kill himself out in the water. And thank God he missed the boat. I mean, it wasn't there. Because if he'd have jumped off of that bridge, he would have possibly drowned in the water. That scared Eddie. That was one of his sobering moments, if you want to call it that. Mike idolized his father and vice versa. I believe you told me that your own boy uh, does quite a little wrestling. Well, yes, uh, he does. In fact, I'm hoping he'll take the state uh, state tournament in the 95-pound division. Uh, how old is he? Uh, he's 10 years old. Even though he's a lovable father, he was demanding. He put high expectations on Mike. And then when my dad started wrestling, he obviously started wrestling under Mike Graham. So maybe that gave him a little bit more of a chip on his shoulder at times. At 222 and one half pounds. My father's a gangster. Graham, Mike Graham. He gave me all the tools to get as good as I could get before I turned pro. My but even that, the pressure the really, and a lot shady. of it came from him. And I loved going someplace where he wasn't going to be because I knew I could go out, I could wrestle, I could come back, and it was a constant scrutiny. My grandfather did throw my dad in the ring, be like, okay, let's see what you got. Graham breaking it up again, arm drag takedown. I remember my dad always saying, Nicole, don't worry. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. So he was not intimidated by anyone's size. Mike was shorter and didn't have the same over-the-top personality, but he had the wrestling knowledge in there from growing up with Eddie Graham. And there it is, there's a fall right out of the boot. So he was a very good worker. He was in plenty of great tag teams, but the attention never went on him specifically. And to be honest, he didn't want to be the top guy. He didn't want to be the big star because people would have said it was because of his father. They got the Debo music in the background. Mike swallowed a lot of shit, you know, and left things go. He did it as well, if not better, than anybody I ever saw being a promoter's <clears throat> kid to blend in with the guys. Ran after Kevin Sullivan. I had the pleasure of being his partner, and I had the pleasure of being his opponent. I can't believe it. They're going to hang him. I get violent, Sullivan, I'm waiting for you. If you go to Mike's bad side, you were on his bad side, and he wasn't going to back down. He knew the pressure he was under. He couldn't go home if he got his ass kicked. And my grandfather was bloody all the time, right? My dad also was bloody. So mornings in my house, my mom would get my brother and I up. My dad would be in bed because he'd get home so late and he was just hungover, <laughs> beat up. And we'd go in to like kiss my dad goodbye in the morning. And there'd be like tape on his forehead with blood and like 
bite marks on his finger and the smell of alcohol oozing from his body. <laughs> and uh, we'd kiss him goodbye. See you later, Dad. Have a good day. Yeah, let me turn right now to Mike Graham because I know he's... As the 1980s dawn, Mike Graham joins Eddie in steering the ship at Championship Wrestling from Florida as the company becomes a breeding ground for wrestling legends, including Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Flair, and Dusty Rhodes. I am the green. I am the man. Go on with it, baby. Dusty was like the original surrogate son. He loved Dusty, and Dusty loved him too. Dusty Rhodes, of course, was always around. We all got to the beach together. Dusty would always say that fat looks better tan. <laughs> <laughs> Graham took Dusty under his wing, and he became the most popular wrestler in the history of the state of Florida. When Dusty turned babyface, the territory was on fire, and all of us became so close, we were like family. And now the ring beginning to fill. Jerry Briscoe charges in, Don Serrano, Brian Blair, and a host of others. As this younger generation elevates the territory to a whole new level, Eddie, now in his 50s, decides to quit the ring for good, just as his pursuits outside of the business begin to bring him trouble. There were a lot of things going on in Eddie's life. He was torn between two women. He was in business with some shady characters. I could tell that Eddie was drinking too much. He was maybe taking too much medication. He had a lot of struggles in his life, um, personally. When he came back in the plane at nighttime, there was a store that was open and he could get a cheap bottle of wine there. Every time he was driving, he would chug a lug that wind down as he would take the bottle and he'd throw it out of the car into the grass. And he came home one night and the place wasn't open and he was so desperate. He went out into the field there and he groveled around in the dirt and found all these bottles. And he sat there in the field and drank the dregs out of those bottles. By this time, alcohol had taken over. He couldn't stop. Wow. Consumed by his alcoholism That's... and burdened with personal and professional wow. troubles, Eddie Graham struggles to find meaning beyond the ring. Over time, people forget who you are, right? My grandmother told a story about how they had gone to a restaurant and they didn't know who he was. He wasn't in the spotlight anymore, but I remember my grandmother being like how he was just not himself after that encounter. When that career is over, who are you? Who's looking back in the mirror? One of the last checks my grandfather wrote was to a liquor store for $8. And in the memo, it said peace of mind. I think if anyone's had time of their life and they just can't find comfort within themselves and they feel like everything's out of control, you just don't have that peace of mind. And he couldn't find it. He turned 55. And I had gone over to my grandparents' house. And I was roller skating. And so I was like skating around him in circles. And I'm like, so what'd you get for your birthday? He's like, 55. And I was like, 55 what? He said, 55 years. Looking back, I realized he was telling me that he was done. That he got 55 years is what he had. I was at the Super Bowl. The Miami Dolphins were playing the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> They paged me, Mike Graham, Mike Graham, please come to the box office. Yeah, I walked into the box office and said, hey, my name is Mike Graham. I paged me. And the woman goes, oh, yeah, you got to call home. Call home. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? It's your dad. Dad? What's wrong with my dad? His wife, Lucy, went out is what she told my daughter. And when she came back, he had shot himself not once, but twice. Jesus. That's what I heard from what 
the coroner said, and I will spare you the gory details about the bedroom. He's in the hospital, and he's hooked up to machines, and a family member has to say to unplug him or keep him alive. And I got back home the next morning and went to the hospital, and there he sat back in the corner, his head all bandaged up and everything. I said, well, it was no accident. So I looked at Mom, and I said, Mom, you know, got to do it. He wouldn't want to be here like this. So we went out. I said, OK, bullet. And he lived about uh, five minutes. It's uh, shocking. I mean, everybody was in a state of shock. I am right now. It is with a deep sense of regret that I announced to you at this time the untimely death of a friend, a colleague, and a leader, Eddie Grant. I immediately started crying. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, why? Why, Eddie? Why would you do that to your son, to your, to your grandchildren? We were young, but my brother was like, if he loved us so much, how could he do this? My brother was very attached to my grandfather. Yeah, very attached. I think that people knew he was depressed, but they never thought Eddie would go that far. He was keeping that to himself. I think he bottled a lot of it up because he didn't want This is why I got to check on your people, man. You know what I mean? Like, I don't... I don't really check on my people like I, I, I used to because, you know, I figured, you know, nobody really checks on me. You know, there's been times where I sat in hotel rooms and, and you know, you know, just, I think it was last year, was it last year, two years ago. I was in that position. So it was like, yeah. You know, you gotta check on your people, man. I want people to know he wasn't as strong as his outside persona was. He realized that if he let people know he was weak, that there were people that would love to have just walked in and taken over. And I think he was probably fighting for the territory, too. We hear the news. Eddie Graham's dead. And <laughs> holy shit, what's going to happen to Florida? We found out within a year, Florida was on its last legs. Vince McMahon was starting the national expansion in 1984, and the territories were going out of business because Vince was trying to suck up all the talent. When WWE um, started robbing the territories, Eddie saw the writing on the wall probably much earlier than most of the people did. A year before Eddie passed away, yeah. the territories started struggling. Yeah, big time. Tell me about that. Well, Dusty left. Took the whole crew with him. Dad had spent years getting Dusty over and creating Dusty Road. But when Dusty left, he took half the territory with him. And that really made Dad mad. It was like he was almost trying to kill the territory for taking all the talent with him. In 1984, Dusty Rhodes leaves Florida to work for Jim Crockett Promotions. With the wrestling industry in chaos, <laughs> Mike Graham is still reeling from his father's death when he inherits the daunting task of leading the territory. Mike picked up like a man, ran the territory, and, um, you know, life went on. Mike was obviously attempting to fill his father's shoes. It wasn't just him trying to do everything, but it just, it wasn't the same place. Where have you been? You've been home. Oh. Okay. Hey, hey. They even ran an angle after Eddie's death with the free birds were down there and they were trying to heat things up and they thought, well, if we desecrate the memory of Florida's most popular wrestler ever, then the fans will hate us. It's like father, like son, you're both losers. Eddie would have wanted Mike to use his death in something that enhanced wrestling. I'm gonna prove to you that he was more of a man 
than the three of you ever be. As long as you live, your ass are mine. It was too far. It was too much. The fans could tell it was desperation because they could see the crowds had shrunk. At the time, things were already shifting because cable TV was starting to come out, and my dad was just trying to keep it afloat. And no matter what he did, it wasn't going to quite stay afloat. Struggling under the weight of Eddie's absence, the once great territory lasts just two more years before closing its doors. Eddie would have been the only one to be able to save it because of all of the NWA promoters of every other territory in the country, the one guy that had the best relationship with Vince McMahon Sr. and would have had one with Vince Jr. was Eddie Graham, and he was gone. Mike and I were at a bar having a couple beers and just talking about his dad, and all of a sudden he broke down. I could tell that his dad not being there weighed heavy on Mike every single day. Already grieving the death of his father and the loss of their family's wrestling empire, Mike Graham is soon to face another devastating tragedy. This is a... Dark Following his story. father's death and the collapse of their company, Mike Graham must now forge a new path outside the promotion that has defined his life's work. This should be an interesting matchup. Mike Graham and Diamond Dallas Page to take on Bill Kazmaier and Juice and Thunder Liger. By that point, Mike was closing in on 40. He got a position with WCW, and he was trying to help mentor some of the younger guys. Obviously, people who knew Mike and knew Eddie respected him and etc. But I think, unfortunately, he never made his mark in WCW as anybody with a lot of pull because he was just one of the soldiers at that point. Oh, he's right in the That's face! It. It. I think that when it shifted and it was more theatrics that was being written by people that had no idea about wrestling. He got a little bit bitter because he was old school. My dad was definitely not a corporate guy. Mike never reached the pinnacle of Eddie's dreams, but he still had a very successful wrestling career and he was a good businessman. He had a great lifestyle, lived on the water, had a altitude of boats, and he won a bunch of offshore races. My brother loved racing boats, and so my dad and brother actually got the chance to race a couple times. My dad never wanted to sit still. He would always be like, yeah, you sleep when you die. He got his first tattoo when he was 40, and it was like a skull with like fire coming out of the head and a lightning bolt going through it. And then underneath it, it said peace of mind. So my dad would always talk to my brother and I about it peace of mind like if you don't have it you have nothing you really don't but like his father before him mike's search for inner peace often ends at the bottom of a bottle he had two driver's licenses actually one legally under mike gossett and one under mike graham so mike gossett got one dui then mike graham got one and then his drinking got so much worse after my grandfather passed away, he was miserable. And um, it just, he changed. Normally, you know, my dad was not like that. He never showed that side to my brother and I. It was always just upbeat. More tough to like my brother, I think, because he wanted him to be a strong, strong man. Steven did have to fight and prove that he wasn't a wimp growing up. Because he was from a wrestling family and he did have kind of like a stronger build, I think everyone expected him to be some tough, mean guy. I think that that hurt him in the long run, but he just kind of never found his stride. We talked every day, you know, text, phone call, whatever. I sent my brother a text in the morning. He didn't respond. I just thought he was working or doing something. And then my dad called me, asking me if I'd heard from Steven. And I was like, I'll go check on him. And so that's how we found out that um, he took his life. When I found my brother, I you know, ran outside and I called my dad first. My dad was saying he'd be there. I'm like, no, no, don't come here, don't come here. 
And so once I was able to leave, I walked into the kitchen with my dad and he said, he said, it's a good thing you found Steven because if I would have found him, you'd be burying both of us because I'd have taken my life right then and there. Jesus Christ. It just floored me. I don't know what the demons were that got him. Again, now here's his sister, poor little Nicole, you know, just distraught. Um, his dad, everybody distraught, you know. Um, it just didn't have to be. I wasn't expecting it um, at all. Because Stephen and I went through and saw how hard it was with my grandfather. We saw what it did to my dad. We saw how it absolutely destroyed our family. But with my grandfather doing what he did, I felt that it made it an option. It turned into something that my that brother felt, nah, he did it. Now we have my grandfather and my brother, who is my best friend, you know, and I found my brother. So everyone was so worried about me, but I was worried about my dad. This is, this is a lot, guys. Like, this is, you know what I mean? Because it's, like, bro, your fucking, grand, your grandfather goes, then your brother goes. And it's like, like, what the fuck? Like, what, what, what is going on? It makes me just, you know what I mean? Like, God damn, bro. Haunted by the death of his son, Stephen, in 2010, Mike Graham struggles with the pain of losing another family member to suicide. I think every parent blames himself. He said, I must have been a shitty son and a shitty father. Pretty heavy. Sometimes we're our own worst critics, and um, we're hard on ourselves about different things. And I think that, um, you know, there's many things that Mike could have thought about, and it was just another one of the things, just knocking on the bad side of his brain. You know, between his dad and now my brother, he just, he just absolutely was crushed. Mike and I were close, but we weren't that fuzzy, fuzzy, good feeling close. And he called me up and said, hey, you know, I love you, right? I said, I love you too, Mike. And that was it. He hung up the phone. My dad met my daughter and I at a park, and I was like, Dad, this ends with Stephen. I'm like, look at her. She doesn't deserve this. What your dad did was horrible. What Steven did, we're never gonna recover from it, but this ends now. Look at her. She doesn't deserve this. And he was like, you're right, Nicole. You're right, Nicole. You're right. But less than two years later, he did the same. He was in Daytona Beach, bike week or something, with his wife. And uh, from what I gather, she went outside and said she was going to go see some friends. That is so fucked up. When she got back and opened the door, simultaneously, she heard a gunshot. And there was Mike, dead in his son Steven's cowboy boots. This is dark, bro. He couldn't break the cycle. You can't see what's behind the person's eyes. They're telling you one thing, they're smiling, but they may be, you know, they may be just absolutely torn up inside. Then you realize he's gone. End of story, you know? No more, there's no more. I mean, I was still trying to pick out the pieces after my brother. Again, it wasn't, it, it was less than two years apart between my brother and my dad. After the conversations I had with my dad, asking him, telling him, begging him, please, this ends with Steven. It was just a different 
level of pain. Mike had been away from wrestling for, and I hadn't seen him in years, but then the news comes out. And I, that was a shock. Even if you're not shocked at anything in wrestling, you still think, well, the same thing can't happen to two different generations. They can't do the same thing. And it happened to three generations. God. You just, how much, the same family, what, how much more can go on? Right. The pattern of suicide that haunts the Gossett family reaches far beyond Eddie, Mike, and Stephen. This heartbreaking cycle of tragedy actually spans four generations and five men. A lot of people don't know this, but Eddie's father killed himself. And also, Eddie's brother Skip killed himself. It's a very vicious cycle when you have a more than one suicide. Oh. One suicide is one too many. Oh. But when you have multiple suicides within the same family structure, it's um, just tragic. My only explanation or thought, because I'm not a doctor, obviously, is but is out, that when one happens, then it makes it viable for someone else when they're having a hard time. And also the fact that depression and addiction is hereditary. And unless you have someone step in and recognize it and get help and let them know that it's not normal what you're feeling, but it's gonna be okay. That just wasn't quite happening in my family. Big time lesson to learn because it isn't just the people that go, it's the people that are left behind. Heavy burden for Nicole to carry and heavy burden for her daughter. This is... Woo. This we are is at the old armory, which is now the Brian Glazier Jewish Community Center. And Larry Simon, who was Boris Malenko, who my grandfather had huge feuds with, his son helped put this together in a way to commemorate all the wrestlers that came here every Tuesday for many, many years. So it's it's pretty great to see, actually. This is my, my dad and my grandfather. Mike and Eddie Graham have won the Florida Tag Team Championship. Nothing can keep the fans away. This was the home of the Titans of Tampa. And this will always be the house, the championship wrestling from Florida Bills. I think wrestling fans should know that they absolutely respected the fans. And I hope that the fans that met them felt that. There was so much good, so much laughter, um, a lot of good times. And those are the things that I focus on more than anything else because they were really exceptional people. I remember Eddie, my papa, as bare-chested with a cast net off the dock catching <clears throat> mullet for us. A lot of love, a lot of love. My brother, my bestie, my best friend, I just wish he knew how everyone loved him and wanted to be there for him. <sighs> Dad. We had that tough relationship because I called him out on things. But there was so much love and respect. I miss my dad so much. I wish he was here to see my daughter grow up because he's missing out on a lot, but that I miss him. Some of the best times of my life were with the Grahams and uh, with all the people that the Grahams brought in. It, there is um, a plethora of good times, a plethora of good times. Dear friends of mine, enjoyed my time with them. Wish we could have had a lot more days. The thing to do is not dwell on the bad, dwell on the good. That's what gets me through. Nicole, love her, love her. She's the legacy of that family. And so my grandfather being silly with me always. <laughs> And it took me a while to get to a place where I felt like I could finally offer some type of assistance. And so I found the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay and they offer amazing services. And I feel that I've come to a point in my recovery and healing that I can hopefully get a word out there that may strike a chord with someone to make it them call for help. Man. 
or survivors that are struggling um, to get out of bed because they've lost family members to know that they should live their lives to honor those that they have lost. There has to be a lesson to everybody that's watching this program that if you feel suicidal, there's helps right around the corner. And I don't care who you are, somebody loves you, always. You have to just make that step by reaching out to someone just to say, something's not right, I'm having these thoughts. Just speak up is what I'd ask. You can have fame, family, money, like, but if you don't have that peace of mind, you have nothing. My grandfather and my dad clearly didn't have it, and my brother didn't have it, but it occurred to me less than a year ago that I have it, and I had been wanting to get a tattoo. I'm not a tattoo person. And all I wanted was my handwriting that says peace of mind and a semicolon, which represents mental health, you know, suicide awareness. Very simple. And it's just an amazing reminder of where I've gotten with my life and how I feel and peace. I have so much to be grateful for, and I'm going to live my best life because that's the best way I can honor them. I am so happy right now. Things are great. My daughter's thriving, amazing friends, family. Like, I'm, I'm really happy, actually. Is it show? Good job. <laughs> Good job. Listen, this was Dark Side of the Mother Loving Ring. I told y'all guys I was going to let this one rock because I knew how deep it was. But listening to the story and how everything went down. It, it got me choked up. I'm not even going to lie to you, bro. It got me choked up because it's, it's just like your father, your grandfather, your brother, your your great-grandfather, and your, your uncle. Like, God damn, bro. Like, uh, this story is fucked. Um... Suicide awareness, man. Uh, mental health awareness. It's very, very important, ladies and gentlemen. Very important. We try to ignore it, but it's very important. So, reach out to your people. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that everything is going to be okay. If you're feeling bad, you're feeling blue. Come to the mother loving big bag network, the high flying podcast on YouTube. Click on one of these videos and let them just ride through, man. You know what I'm talking about? That was, uh, I, I just came out of work and I really want to go to sleep, but that just kind of like fucked my. I don't want to go to sleep after that, you know what I mean? Like just listening to that story. So I feel like I should do another one. But that was, <laughs> that was fucked up, man. Jesus Christmas. So, um, yeah, guys, that's wild. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. It's the dark side of the ring. You know, this is my favorite segment of the podcast. Like, share, and subscribe on the mother loving uh, YouTube on High Flying Podcast with your boy Biggie Bag Johnny. Biggie Bag Johnny on all platforms. Go follow me and subscribe on everything. I appreciate you guys because I see you guys is tuned to love in. And uh, I just want to give all my love back that I'm getting. So I appreciate you guys. I'm tired as fuck. So I'm going to get with you guys later, man. This was the Dark Side of the Ring with the High Flying Podcast. I'm your host, Biggie Bag Johnny. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe that motherfucking button. Turn on all notifications. And see me when 